Morning, everyone. I'm a big lad. I need a little bit more space behind the lecture. It is, it's great to be here with you. And as Nina said, it's just great to be working with you, two churches in partnership together. But not only in terms of partnership, the whole transforming Essex, love Essex dynamic. God is doing something great and powerful amongst us. Not just in Wickford, but across our county. It's our time to stand up and see what we sing about happen in everyday life, in every one of our lives, in every one of the places that we work and we go and we live and we have our being. God is saying it's our time. And it's exciting just to be able to partner with you and, and journey that with you and see, thank you, um, and see what God is doing. There's a verse in Romans 1 that says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel Because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God. The only trouble is, I've come to the conclusion that I'm a little bit ashamed on occasions. Over the last year or so, the moments when actually I've become aware I'm a little bit ashamed of him, of the gospel. We, we wrap it up, maybe we call it fear, maybe we, we talk about it as being the circumstances weren't quite right. You know, there wasn't quite enough time in that moment, but actually the truth of it is there are times when the fear, the anxiety, the stuff of life gets in the way and we find ourselves... Maybe a little bit like Peter, when Jesus has been arrested, distancing ourselves from Jesus. And I just want to encourage us this morning to to take a moment and just to reflect. How unashamed of him are we? How unashamed are we of the gospel? You're um, a couple of weeks into a new series looking at the culture of the kingdom and I've been given a little bit of freedom today so I'm not going to do that but can I, can I just encourage you that when you start living out the culture of the kingdom that puts you on the front line. When you start living out the cultures of the kingdom in everyday life that puts you right on the front line and you'll soon discover whether you're ashamed of the gospel or not. When you try and live the culture of the kingdom in the world out there. It's hard enough sometimes to live it in church, but when you want to start living it out in the world, in the real world, in the world out there, in everyday life, in your nine to five, you'll soon discover whether you're ashamed of the gospel or not because you will face resistance. You will face people that don't want to work like that, live like that, behave like that. One of your messages has been on freedom, I think, the last few weeks. And I work in, I work in a number of places. I work in a school in South End that will remain nameless. But the culture of freedom against the culture of control came to a head spectacularly <laughs> last week. And it costs. To live the culture of the kingdom, it costs. But when we live that on the front line and we live it in everyday life, that is the place where we see breakthrough. That's the place where we see heaven come. That's the place we see Jesus come. That's the place where light takes over and darkness is dispelled. That's the place of miracles. That's the place where you and I get to see what we sing about in reality. And I just want to encourage each one of us. We don't have to be ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God, and he is who he says he is. It says in Matthew 16, Jesus asked, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter, Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, 
Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Peter had come to a place of revelation of who Jesus was, the Messiah. And that changed everything. And that's been part of my journey of becoming less ashamed of who he is when you really understand who he is. He's the Messiah. We're not talking about Kevin Keegan who way back, many decades ago, stepped back into club management with no expertise of management, no, never managed a club, no coaching certificates, and turned a club around in a matter of months. We're not talking about that type of Messiah. We're talking about the Messiah. We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about understanding. When he reveals himself to us, everything changes in a moment. Who do they say I am, he asked. Or you could be a prophet, or Jeremiah, or John the Baptist. I, we don't really know. We've been around, we've heard the stories. We maybe even met him or heard him preach, or heard the testimonies of what he's doing in our towns and in our villages. But they don't really know. Because it can't be revealed to you by man. It can only be revealed to you by your Father in heaven. But the revelation of Jesus as the Messiah changes everything. And I don't know, you might be in this room today and you may have only ever heard about him and never met him. Well, today's your day. Because you can, you can meet him for the first time. And it will change your life. You may have been around him You may have experienced him as this prophet. I've been a Christian now for 30 plus years. And for some of that time, I would have experienced Jesus the prophet. I would have experienced his words. I would have experienced his his guidance. I would have experienced him putting hope into my life. Giving me hope. Giving me purpose. Giving me direction. Giving me understanding of what will be. But it is exactly that. It's hope for a future day. When you experience Jesus as the Messiah, it's not just a future hope, but it's a living day reality that God is who he says he is in your life, doing the things that he would say. It says in Habakkuk chapter 2, Write down the revelation, make it plain on tablets so a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of an end. It will not prove false. Although it lingers, wait for it and it will come to pass. I feel like I've spent a lot of my life in that type of dynamic. You've heard God. You've heard the prophetic voice of God. You've taken it on board. You're running with it in life. But it feels like it's a never-ending linger of, of hope and future desire. And this thing that says, will it ever come to pass? Will it ever become a reality? Will I ever see my breakthrough? And maybe that's just me. Maybe, you know, you don't live in that place. But... In a number of people that I, I connect with and I work with and I, I live with and I just love on, they've heard the good news. And it feels like they've waited so long for it that that hope is waning. That desire is waning. That, that faith is, is waning. That maybe they're not quite as bold or courageous as they once were, as I once was. 
Maybe we aren't living with that conviction that he steps in now and can change everything. And part of my journey and part of my, my walk with God over the last year, 18 months, has been the realisation that God moves now, not just in the future, not just a long day. And I just want to encourage all of you who have been waiting for God for their breakthrough for a period of time. It feels like it's lingering. It feels like they've waited longer than they've ever hoped for, longer than they've ever desired, longer than they've ever expected. And I just want to say over to you, it will come. It will come. God is drawing us into a time and to a season where we will see the breakthrough and we will see God heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out the demons. We are living in a new spiritual atmosphere. Something has shifted in our county that says we can have an expectation of what God is doing now that we wouldn't have had in the years gone past. God is doing something new. And the stories and the testimonies of the breakthroughs that we're seeing are just phenomenal. We stood up there in your conference room, I don't know, a year ago. We started dreaming about a Love Essex event on the 9th of July and what that would look like and whatever. And we said, what would it look like if we'd actually seen 100 people saved before we get to the day. Like, I don't think I've ever seen a hundred people saved in a decade, let alone a year. But we're probably over halfway. We're probably over halfway. God is doing something fresh and new in our county. You might you might know some of our story at SCF at the moment. We've got a few people that are going through some really serious life-limiting, life-shortening illnesses at the moment. And yet, we have seen God do more in terms of healing in the last few months. We've seen people get healed. We've seen people be released of pain. We've seen testimonies of what God's doing, not just in the church, but beyond. As people are coming alive with the gospel and taking the gospel, the power of God, outside the walls of the church and the feedback and the testimonies of when people pray for their family and for their friends, for their neighbours, for their work colleagues. This dynamic of God is moving now. But I've heard it all before. I've heard it all before. I've got excited before. I've hoped before. I've dreamt before. I've desired before. I've longed for it before. I've stepped out before. So many of us live with the disappointments of yesterday. But God is saying he's doing something new. And there is a dynamic about what happened with Simon Peter that day that wasn't logical, but was an encounter with God. And I can't convince you or persuade you that God is going to do something different in our county in this year, in these coming years, that will blow our minds, that we won't have seen before. There's nothing I can say or do to move you on that position, and I'm not even going to try. But I do know this, an encounter with God changes everything. An encounter with him changes everything. A encounter with him, the realisation and the recognition of who he really is changes everything. We become a city earlier this year and um, we really felt God speak to us out of that. That we were to be a city that was going to be built on rock and roll. And um, some of you in here might know a song about that. They built this city on rock and roll and they almost shot me the day that I turned the PA up, full blast. And, but we want the real deal. Yeah. We don't want our city built on sausage roll or toilet roll. <laughs> we don't want it built on entertainment. No. We don't want to build on materialism. Who remembers stockpiling toilet rolls? <laughs> the most material necessity you need for life. And we stockpiled them as a nation. And there are still people that haven't bought toilet rolls for two years because they're still using up their supplies. We don't want our city built 
on materialism or entertainment or on good food. But on the rock, which is the revelation of who Jesus is and his power to roll away the stone. And, and Sally shared earlier, out of the power of Jesus to roll away the stone. Well, our city, our county is going to be built on the revelation of who Jesus is as the Messiah, as the Saviour, as the Deliverer, as the one who comes and brings breakthrough and his power to roll away the stone. Amen. And it is for our city, but it's for our county. And when we put Jesus back and we encounter him, suddenly our hope is no longer a hope, it turns into faith. Yeah. It turns into an expectation of breakthrough in the moment because you cannot separate Jesus from his power. So if you encounter Jesus, you will encounter his power. And if you've encountered his power, you've encountered Jesus. says in Psalm 62, Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress and I will never be shaken. Samuel 2 Samuel 22 says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress and my deliverer. We ordered pizza for my daughter's birthday yesterday. And the delivery driver arrived on time. Who's ordered anything from Amazon in the last week and received their delivery? Who gets upset if Amazon Prime doesn't deliver the next day and you have to wait 48, 72 hours for your delivery? Can I say it never used to be like that? When I was a kid, I used to have to wait to the weekend for my dad to take me to the shops. And as a Wickford boy, there weren't too many shops in Wickford High Street, so we had to go to Basildon or somewhere where there were more shops. And if they didn't have it, you had to wait for them to receive the goods from their head office. Now, if the pizza is five minutes late, if the Amazon don't do same day or next day delivery. We wonder what's wrong. There's a season that's shifted. The Bible talks about first in the natural, then in the spiritual. And I want to say today, he is our deliverer. He delivers for us. He's not just a promise maker, but he's a promise keeper. He doesn't just make a promise and hope that we hold on long enough for a future day. He delivers on his word. I'm trying to work out whether I was a single-digit boy or just in double figures when I first saw someone walk out of a wheelchair. Probably was around 10 or 11. A guy had been involved in an accident. Told he'd never walk again. Just been relieved from his job because he couldn't work. until Sunday morning came round. Someone was crazy enough to say, can we pray for you? And as they reached out his hand, he got up. And I've seen stories like that in the nations of the world. I've seen stories like that in the UK. But that story happened in Shotgate. That story happened in Whitford. That story changed my life forever. To see as a young boy, God do something in a moment. To encounter Jesus in a moment. And his power to move away the stone. Amen. We can't teach you this stuff. We can't preach you this stuff. But we can create a moment where you and I can look him in the face. And see who is he. But Jesus, you are the Messiah. You are the Son of the living God. You are my salvation and my deliverer. You are my rock and my fortress. And on that revelation, Jesus looks to him and says, 
Here's the keys to the kingdom. Here's the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will now be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. But the revelation of who he is. You see, we are sons and daughters of the king, but unless we're in relationship with the king, unless we have the right understanding of who he is, we will have empty promises. And we'll be waiting for our delivery. But when we encounter him, when we realise who he is, he's not just a prophet. He's so much more. He's not just a pastor. He's so much more. He's not just a shepherd or a teacher or a great evangelist. He's so much more. He is the Messiah and the Messiah will always deliver on time. And we are in a season now, a prophetic season for our county, where we're meant to stand up and realise that if we're not ashamed of him, And if we're for him, and if we're willing to be identified with him, we see the power of the gospel at work in every moment of our lives. I was in Southend Hospital waiting room last Sunday afternoon. I was taking my dad for a scan. It was nice on a Sunday. No parking issues. It's great. Love it. (laughs) Always go on a Sunday. Tip from a local. And this guy comes out. He was having a different test, I don't quite know. But he starts to talk to me about his prostate cancer that has just spread to his bones. He didn't hold back all the glory details. And it's like, I'm in this moment. All I can hear is, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it's the power of God to bring salvation. And I'm like, hurry up, Dad, hurry up, Dad, hurry up, Dad. And then someone else comes and talks to him and he goes away. The relief. There wasn't time. It wasn't the moment. And then he comes back. (laughs) And he picks up the conversation again. It's like, here we go then. In for a penny. In for a pound. I have worked on every excuse I can possibly come up with. Why not to talk to this guy? Why not to go for healing? Why not to see his cancer healed in a moment? I've come up with a lot. And Jesus has brought him back to me. So here we go. This might sound a bit weird, mate. But actually I'm a Christian minister. And I believe that Jesus wants to teach, touch you today. Meet you today and heal you today. Can I pray with you? He only went and said yes. <laughs> so there I am, in the waiting room, praying. What did Robbie Dawkins say, all in lessons about how we heal the sick? Should have been paying more attention. But we're in. And you can feel the presence of God, feel in this room. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I worked in insurance for 18 years. And I did discover after a few years, why is it on a Monday morning when people say, do you have a good weekend? I always talked about the football, the motor racing, or the barbecue we went to. (laughs) If you work in an office, if you work in a school, if you work in a hospital, if you work physically around people, you watch tomorrow morning, someone will ask you, how was your weekend? I want to challenge you right now. How are you going to answer that question? How was your weekend? Because the grown people will be fun this afternoon. The football was a bit disappointing, and I'm hoping there's steak on the barbecue this afternoon. But how was your weekend? When I sat and encountered God in the midst of some beautiful worship, and do you know what he said? He said, the gospel is the power of God for salvation. The gospel is the power of God. It's the greatest delivery service that has ever been. And whatever your breakthrough is now, he can come right now and be your breakthrough. Can I pray for you? Can I step in? Can I introduce you to an encounter with Jesus? Can I I open up for you something that will change your life? Because when we identify ourselves with Jesus, he breaks through. He breaks in. 
when we identify ourselves with him on the front line, he breaks through. I talked about the school that I work with, and I do work in a couple of different environments, but one of them in particular. And um, there's a member of staff there that has guessed what I do for a living. Because it shows. And it makes a difference. Culture will put you on the front line. Culture will create for you an environment for you where you stand out. And can I say, encourage you, every one of the cultures you look at, you know, freedom, honour, justice, righteousness, and I don't know where you're going to go and what you're going to listen to over the next few weeks, but they will put you on the front line, but they will be your doorway to the miraculous. They will be your doorway to the opportunity to talk about Jesus. They'll be your doorway to create an environment in which you can talk about the Messiah and his power to roll away the stone. It will be your opportunity on the back of which you can talk about who he is to you, what he's done in your life, and what he can do for the person in front of you. And I want to encourage us all, not just to live the culture, but to live with an expectation of the supernatural, an expectation of God breaking out, an expectation of miracles, an expectation of the, the gifts of the Spirit. You know, I, am, I spend most of my time in churches, and it is really freaking me out how little contact I have with non-Christians. Or people beyond the walls of the church. If we want to be those that seek first his kingdom, we need to be in the world. Yeah. And not just in his temple. Yeah. But in that place, we need to be salt and light. We need to be the light of the world. You know, when he gives us the keys to his kingdom, he gives us authority, he gives us anointing, he gives us gifting, and he gives us a new level of responsibility. And I just want to release over you prophetically today. I believe you're moving into a season, you're in a season, you're at the start of a new season where God is increasing your authority, increasing your anointing, increasing your gifting, and increasing your responsibility. Jesus. And in the Old Testament, they talk about a priestly anointing, a prophetic anointing, and a kingly anointing. And you are called to rule. He's anointing you with a fresh kingly anointing as people of influencers, as ambassadors of Jesus, as, as, as those that are sent apostolically into your environment to reveal the Messiah and his power to roll away the stone. And please, I want to encourage you. There is a fresh grace on you. Many of us were birthed out of a hunger for the presence of God, for the things of the Spirit, for the gifts of the Spirit. A number of you of an older generation would have paid a price to be in environments where you were free to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. Please don't go back. Please don't be ashamed of the things that you once paid a price of, but press on into God. This is our time. There is a new season on us, a new authority on you, that when you speak, you bind on earth what... No, let me get it right. I was a bit told off. <laughs> Whatever you bind on earth, yeah. he will back it up. Amen. I am, one, lo one more story and then I'll close. I used to work, as I said, in, in insurance. And over the years, I used to have to sign some pretty big checks. Some checks that were worth well over a million of pounds. Millions of pounds worth on any one check. You know, back in the day, before you'd done it all on your phone. Yeah. <laughs> And I was an authorised signatory, recognised by the bank as someone that directly could spend this money. It wasn't my money. It was the company's money. But when I signed a cheque, the company had to honour it. Even if they disagreed with what I was spending the money on, when I signed the cheque, the bank had to process it, and the company had to pay. And if they really disagreed with it, we used to have a discussion afterwards. But the cheque would be honoured because I was authorised to sign. I just want to say, Jesus authorises you to sign. When he sent out the 72, 
he gave him a commission. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, and drive out the demons. Freely you have received, freely you give. You are authorised. You are authorised by heaven to heal the sick. You are anointed by heaven to heal the sick. You have the gifting through the Holy Spirit to heal the sick. And now I believe he's given you a responsibility to heal the sick. He's given us a mandate. The responsibility now is on us to heal the sick. Why don't we just stand? He's given us the keys to the kingdom. There's an offer for you this morning to receive the keys of the kingdom. He's making you signatories of heaven this morning. He's given you the authority you need to activate the power of heaven. He's here to anoint you this evening. He's here to give you a gift of healing, wisdom. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are freely available for you to take. Paul just encourages you to take the good ones. And I think he's commissioning you this morning and calling you. Will you stand up and take responsibility for those around you? I've had to make him a, a decision in my heart in the last six weeks. I never want to walk past a sick person again and not stop and say, can I pray for you? I never want to walk past someone and leave them in the state they're in again. When I know that I have the authority, the anointing, the gifting, and the responsibility to bring change into their lives. And so do you. So Holy Spirit, I pray now that you release amongst these beautiful people a fresh level of grace. A fresh encounter with you as Jesus, the Messiah. The greatest delivery driver there has ever been. It awaits appointed time. And that time is now. <laughs>